deal. And wasn't that exciting about the, what God's done for that hospital? I just, I was pumped all week prepping for that. Oh, that's, I feel like, yeah, you know, clap or something. That was great. I suppose that's a, uh, appropriate. We're in a series on emotions, right? And uh, I want to stop for a couple moments this morning, just think through, oh, man, the list of the things that we have done when our good sense got overridden by our emotions. I mean, we don't want to spend a lot of time here. This is going to, that'd be pretty depressing way to go, right? But uh, we, you know, you think through as a, as a group this size, the things that we have done, the mistakes we've made when our good sense got overridden by emotions. For some of us, man, we, we stayed in relationships that we had no business being a part of. Not even because necessarily we, I mean, we even knew it was wrong and we knew it wasn't healthy, uh, but we stayed because we were afraid that, you know, we would just be too lonely or we would be feeling unwanted or, or something. And so we, we stayed in a relationship we, we had no business being a part of. Uh, others of us it didn't do that. We did, it did the exact opposite. We ended a relationship. Not because it wasn't good for us, not because it wasn't healthy, not even maybe because it wasn't God honoring, but because we we just at some point along the way we we just lost hope that it could finally get better, or we could solve it, or or maybe maybe because the other person was actually being a friend and they were saying things that we just didn't want to hear, and so in our emotionally charged state we. said some stuff and called it off and it's just never been the same since and we can just keep on going with all the things that we've done when our good sense got overridden by our emotions we bought stuff some of us have heavily engaged in what do they call it retail therapy right we bought stuff we so we ate stuff because we were depressed or we were sad or we were anxious and so we ate and then we ate, and, and that didn't do it, so then we ate some more, and, and then we ended up with what I like to call pant stress, right? Where you just don't quite fit in your britches well anymore, and so that created other stress, right? So, we, so you know, one stress gave way to pant stress, right? Maybe some other problems there, yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, this just goes on and on. We, we, we would, at times, we, we've withdrawn, we've checked out. Or we said... The things we've said. We've indulged. Right? The places we went. Self pity we hung on to. Um, and, and, and then the, uh, perhaps this is one of the worst parts of it. There have been a lot of times when we said yes to what an emotion was telling us to do. And, and so, you know, because it was just screaming at us do this, do this, do this, do this. And so we finally said yes to it only to have it then turn on us and we got hit with a new nasty emotion that made us feel guilty for doing what we just thought we we just got told to do by our emotions i don't i don't want you to answer this question out loud but think with me for a minute how many of your biggest regrets in life are the result of following an emotion and i think for us as americans this is incredibly likely because we are told all the time follow your hey you saw that movie too right follow your heart because and and i mean they're not even subtle about it in in a lot of the cultural things we hear they say follow your heart because your heart will never lie to you what they must have a totally different heart than i have my heart lies to me on a pretty regular basis So we followed our heart, and it was an untrustworthy guide. Guys, hear me this morning again. It's not that our emotions are necessarily evil, okay? Don't go there. But slavery to our emotions, now that's an evil. That's an evil. And so um, here we go. Let's just jump right in. Here's the big idea. I suppose this means once you get this, you could write it down, and then you could sleep until the communion time. But uh, hopefully you won't. Here's the big idea. A follower of Jesus will be like Jesus, right? 
That's what we talked about last week. We are not trying to become, through our series together, we are not trying to become simply well-adjusted, emotionally stable people. I want us to be that, but that's not enough. We want to become people who are followers of Jesus. We want to become like Jesus. And if we become like Jesus, that means that we're going to experience some strong emotions. And we're even going to be led by them to appropriate actions. But what we don't want to be, because we want to be like Jesus, we don't want to be enslaved by our emotions. We, in other words, we, we want to be able to be free. We want to be able to experience and use our emotions like Jesus. But we don't want to be enslaved. And by that I mean forced into obeying the counsel of our emotions. Forced into doing whatever it is we feel compelled to do. That's what we want to avoid is the enslavement. And so, guys, because our Father loves us, it is not shocking that our Heavenly Father has taken action to help us to be able to not only experience emotions, but to avoid slavery. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Four things that God has done to help us avoid slavery to our emotions. Here we go. Number one, God taught us the proper use of emotions, right? God taught us the proper use of emotions. Emotions are tools. This was week one in a nutshell. God taught us, okay, you have this emotion. This is what that's made to help you do. And this is what that's made to help you be motivated to act. So God, in his great grace, says, here, let me, let me show you what these things are for and what you do with them. That was week one in our series. The second thing that God has done for us to help us is God has taught us how to put appropriate limits on our responses to what our emotions tell us to do. God taught us what the appropriate limits are. Let me give you just a couple examples so you know where I'm going with this. Jesus taught us to not let fear turn into worry. Fear isn't a bad thing. Fear is there to help us recognize when we're in danger so that we will proceed with caution, right? Week one. But it's gone too far when we, if we let fear turn into a state, a, a lifestyle of worry. And so Jesus taught us, hey, these are the limits. Don't go beyond this. I'll give you a second one. Don't let happiness turn into entitlement. You know, happiness is a great thing, but the purpose of happiness, remember, wasn't just so we felt happy. The purpose of happiness was to help us to slow down, pause, enjoy, savor the moment, savor the good gift God gave us, and then, after we savored it, to turn our attention to God and say, God, thank you. This is a gift. But what a lot of us do in our nature, in our sin nature, not our new nature, our new nature is awesome, but in our sin nature, what a lot of us do is we let happiness turn into entitlement. We begin to believe, I actually deserve all the good stuff in my life, and number one, and number two, I can't live without it. And Jesus said, no, 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 that's not where you want to go. And so he taught us what these limits are. So a follower of Jesus w will respond appropriately to these strong emotions. Number one, he'll use them for the uh, appropriate use. And number two, he'll stay within the limits when he experiences things like happiness and anger and fear and guilt and sadness and jealousy and compassion, envy, and so on. As we move into this third thing, though, I, I, maybe I can help us get a better feel for it. Ryan Krakowski, you, you come on down. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be a really awesome. You could help me out with this. Yeah, you're getting applause and you haven't even done anything yet. <laughs> I want you to know this is a nice church. Yeah, come right up front here. This is a really nice church. Pastor Joel preached for five weeks, and I mentioned how I was glad that, you know, it was going to be my turn and stuff, but I didn't want to rush it because he's doing a good job. And they applauded a preacher. I've never seen that happen. Sorry, this is valuable. I need to move that off of here. Um, so uh, thanks for coming up. Yeah, back in my college days, I, uh, I was a chemist. I worked in a lab and stuff. We had this... Uh, we had this acid. It was incredibly powerful stuff. We kept it in this glass jar, and it was basically it ate everything. So we would put it into other glass jars, other glass things when we needed to get them super, super clean because it literally ate everything. And so one night I was working late in the lab, and uh, there were some other guys, and they, they accidentally broke the jar. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it, so the acid was like going on the counter, and then it went down the cupboard, and then on the floor and stuff. And it was literally eating the, 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 the countertop 
burning its way down the wood things and chewing, eating right through the tile floor. So these guys were cleaning up as fast as they possibly could by basically they put like five pairs of gloves on each and, uh, and it would just throw like half rolls of paper towels down onto this acid spill on the floor and then they'd pick it up real quickly and throw it in the trash can never thinking that when they got done they pick up the trash can there's no bottom to it anymore but um <laughs> so that was so they had to do it all over again so anyways what was really funny while they were doing all that is i mean it's literally eating the tile and everything and um there was a professor working on, on the lower level and he comes up because these guys are running back and forth trying to clean up this massive acid spill and this professor says what in the world are you guys doing it sounds like you're coming right through the floor and I'm thinking, my, well, that's because they are, right, <laughs> you know? So, anyways, um, i tell you all that to, to lead to where we want to head today. Uh, yikes, we did not spill. Okay, uh, I, I got some good stuff, and uh, I'm going to need your help. Okay, so just in a minute, I need to get some gloves on here. Do you, do you want to? glasses. I, I think these are new for me. Do you want to wear some? All right, go ahead. Those are for you. I, I care about your safety, sort of. Um, just a second here. I ripped my glove already. I guess I'm nervous. Yeah, I used to wear these all the time. Not this pair. Okay. Here's the deal. I need to finish filling this right to the very, very, very brim. This is kind of like, oh, shoot, we spilled just a little bit. We'll do this fast. Okay, that's very full, right? Okay, we need to not spill any more. I got this specially treated cloth here, which helps. Great. All right, so here's the deal. We need to not spill any more. So here's, here's what I want to do. I, I want to, as you can tell, if I try to put anything else in there, I'm going to have a small problem. But I, I really want to put some marbles in there. So what I need you to do is I need you to take your hands, and I need you to put your hands around the top of this so that it, nothing leaks out when I do this. <laughs> All right? All right. Go ahead. Would you do that for me? That's really great. Yeah, let me get some. Oh, I lost my marbles. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Let's get some good-sized ones. Here we go. Several people knew I lost my marbles. All right, so here's the deal. No, <laughs> This is not good for this to leak, okay? All right. So you're going to hold that, you're going to contain that, and you're not going to let me drop these marbles in there, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Is your mom okay with this? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> when you joined as members, there was a little fine print there. Right. So no one in their right mind would actually let me, if, if this is indeed the acid that I led you to believe, no one in their right mind would let me just drop this in here, right? No. Okay. There was just a little room still at the top, guys. We're okay. And you certainly, now that you know that there's even less room at the top, you certainly wouldn't let me do another one, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was that little sound you just made. Oh, dude, it's leaking. Uh, yeah. Uh, you should probably go to the bathroom and wash your hands quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm done with you. Uh, wait, can you take this with you? <laughs> no, just kidding. There's no good way to transport that. I don't know what we're going to do about it. Thanks. Here's the deal. Uh, obviously, you know that we substituted out the acid for water because, well, trustees made me. No. <laughs> This this illustration didn't start with me. It actually comes from a, a book called The Heart of Anger by Lou Priolo. But I want you to imagine for a second, this, this container represents your heart. Your heart is full all the time, isn't it? Our heart is full. And these marbles that I just dropped in there, they represent the stuff that comes into our life. You know, So I'm just going through my day, and then I get that phone call of a person, and they want something, and they're telling me, what, or that person does something, or, or the person who cuts me off when I'm trying to drive or whatever, that 
those things that come into our life, those are like the marbles. And here's what everybody knows, right? There's a saying, you can, you can finish it for me. What goes up must come down. There's another one Jesus had. Whatever's on the inside comes out, right? And so whatever's in my heart, when the stuff of life happens, will come out because the heart is full. And so whatever's on the inside, when things happen to me, that's what's going to come out. Now, uh, I lost my notes somewhere in the process of all this. But uh, this is where the danger is for us because the truth is we can't hold it in, can we, guys? And so this is the third thing that God did for us. He warned us about the dangers of an unexamined heart and simply trying to contain our emotions. You know what a lot of us try to do? Just what I tried to set Ryan up to do. Listen, everything in here is toxic, right? So don't let it come out, because if you do, there'll be serious damage. And we know that, right? We know we can't explode on the people around us. We know we can't tell them what we're thinking. Because if we do, we'll be get fired or we'll be, right, or something like that. So we know we have to somehow contain it and somehow keep it in. And guys, that's good. I don't, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying to you, take the filter off, okay? That's not what I'm saying to you this morning. Uh, if anything, some of us need to put the more filter on, okay? And that's, so that's not what I'm saying. But this is what Jesus steps up to the counter and says to us. He says, listen, don't put all of your effort into trying to hold it in. Instead, change what's in there so that when it spills out, that's okay. Don't put all your effort into making sure you can contain it. Change the toxicity level of your heart because it will come out, right? What's the verse say there in, um, in, in uh, Matthew? No, excuse me, Luke 6, 45, right? A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart for the... Right? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Whatever is in will come out. Jesus taught us that. He warned us. And so that's why it makes no, uh, no surprise to us whatsoever in Proverbs chapter 4 that we read these words, right? Guard your heart. In other words, pay attention. Is this toxic? Because if this is toxic... The day will come, no matter how good you are at holding your hands around it. If this is toxic, hear me well, the day will come when there will be enough marbles dropped in and you will not be able to fake it and you will not be able to contain it. I learned this lesson a little bit the hard way. Uh, Last year we were going through some pretty trying situations there on the mission field. And and by God's grace... um, you know, I did not did not say anything, and uh, we just stayed in the game day in, day out, and we, and, we, and we tried to keep working towards a solution. But one of the guys that I was working with started responding to me very negatively to me as if I had said something. You know what it was? He was really good at reading body language. I couldn't fudge it. I couldn't fake it. I couldn't contain it. So I kept my mouth shut. But somehow my body language is still let it out. That's why Jesus says to us, listen, listen, guard your heart. In other words, pay attention to this. Is this toxic? Because if it is, it will come out. So don't put all your best efforts into keeping it in. Put all your best efforts into changing what's in there so that when it spills out, that's still okay. And even better yet, if you could somehow have a joyful heart, then when it spilled out, that'd be a blessing on those around you. Amen? So, there we go. That's number three. So, that leads me to another question. Can we choose which emotions we feel or experience? Can we, can we, you know, I'll thinking I want to feel must feel pretty sad today. Or I'm going to, I want to feel happy now. 
yeah. Can, can we do that? I, I, I got a couple laughs. That's as much as I get out of you. Yeah, I heard a sort of. Yeah, it's not real reliable, not real predictable. Especially, and it seems like the harder you try, the worse it gets. Like, you're not afraid, you're not afraid, you're not afraid, you're not afraid. Then why am I shaking, right? You, you probably notice as you've read through the Bible, if you've been doing the Bible thing for a while, that there are lots of commands that tell us what to do, right? Plenty of commands that tell us what things, actions we should take. There are plenty of commands that seem to tell us, like, what we should think about. There are plenty of commands that tell us which things we should value, that we should say are important or we should treasure, right? But you're not finding a pretty large list of feel this way commands, are you? You notice that? Lots of, lots of scriptures that tell us act this way. Lots of scriptures that say think on these things. Lots of scriptures that say value or treasure these things. But there are not many scriptures that say feel this way. And I think the reason is because we cannot, as a general rule, we cannot directly choose which feelings or emotions hit us or which ones we experience. We, we can't really control that very well. But that does not mean we cannot, this is number four, that doesn't mean we can't influence them. God has taught us in his word how to influence our emotions. So I don't think we, we got a button that we can push that's like, okay, you will feel compassionate now. But we can influence that. We can influence that. Now, to, to, to go where we need to go here in the next couple of minutes, I need, I need to jump into the kind of the theoretical and the theological realm for just a minute in order to make this all make sense, and then we'll come back to the highly practical, okay? So there are a number of terms, biblical terms, for the various parts of a person. And the list just came up behind me, I think. A lot of biblical terms for the various parts of a human being. And please know this, that sometimes these terms, when you read them in the Scripture, sometimes they are defined very precisely. And so it has a very specific, precise meaning. And sometimes it's much more general and broad and so that causes a little bit of confusion for us. We do the same thing in the English language all the time. For example, in the church world, we talk about vision. And sometimes when we talk about vision, we're talking very specifically about the destination we want to arrive at as a church. But sometimes when we use the word vision, we use it in a much broader sense, and it's actually it's vision plus mission plus our strategic plan plus all, all kind of rolled in together, and we call that our vision. You with me? Same kind of thing happens in the Bible. There are a lot of different words that get translated as heart, especially heart and soul. And so sometimes they're used in a very general sense, and sometimes they're used in a very specific, precise sense. When that's used in a general sense, that word heart is very broad, and it means everything. It means the things you value or your will, and it means your emotions. It means basically it, everything that's your immaterial part that's the driver part of your life. Anything that's driving your actions. That's when it's in its general sense. When it's in its really specific sense, it really keys in on your will or your values or your volition, if you want a bigger word, right? The choice that you choose to make. Your heart is your ability to choose when it's used in its precise sense. Your, ma your soul is a, oh man, that's got a huge range, but in general... The Bible uses it to, to all that makes up your life essence. That's your soul. Your mind, sometimes it's just your thoughts when you read it in the Scriptures, but a lot of times it's your thoughts and your feelings. So when the Bible uses that word mind, it's both of those ideas put together. And then your body, I think we got that one down. That's the physical part, the material part. And then your, the Bible talks a lot about the others part, the social part of us. We are social, relational human beings, okay? So, why, why point all that out? Well, because of this. There is a huge, huge interplay between the parts. We are one. We're a one being. But there's this huge interplay to, between the parts. You, you know this already, right? Your body, what's going on in your body can have a huge effect on your, name any other part, your emotions. 
What's going on in your body can have a huge effect on how you deal with other people. What's going on in your body can have a huge effect on how, you, how you're feeling uh, and, and what you value and what, what you're willing to do and not willing to do, right? And even on the way you, you think. I have a good friend who, who wears a, a necklace on certain days, and it's a dragon. And I, and I asked her about it one day. I was like, so tell me about the dragon. She's like, well, I got it when we were on this, on this trip, you know, over to Europe. And so it has some happy memories. But I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And then she quickly continued. She said, but that's not the real reason I wear it. She said, I've learned that pain changes people. She said, I'm in pain a lot of the time. And so on the days when I'm in a lot of pain, I wear this to remind me not to be dragon lady. Our body can have a huge impact on us. But it all goes the other way too, right? Our heart can impact our our body. Our heart can impact our emotions. And our mind can impact our emotions, right? Because we are connected and there's this huge interplay. So how how do we change or how do we influence our emotions, right? Um... Here we go. There are several things we can do. We can use our mind to influence our emotions, can't we? And that's what the Bible teaches us to do. Use your mind to influence your emotions, right? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Set your minds on things above, right? We can choose what we think about, and that can have a huge impact on the emotions that we are experiencing uh, I realized this a number of years ago that um, there were thoughts I was thinking that were not safe. Uh, you know what I mean by that? They, they weren't. There are certain thoughts, if you think them, and you think that day in, day out, day in, day out, and you do that for six weeks straight, that will change you into a person that's probably a good person. You'll be a better person for thinking those thoughts day in, day out for six weeks straight. There are other thoughts, if you think that, And you nurture that thought every day for six weeks? Oh, that's not going to turn out good, right? Those thoughts are not safe for me to think. And uh, the other thing I realized that went right along with that was not only are certain thoughts just not safe for me to think, that when I'm in one of those funks where, you know, this stuff's happening and I'm really sad or I'm really depressed or I'm really angry or whatever, and I know, and I finally realize that those thoughts are not okay, they're not going to help me, and if I keep thinking that self-pity garbage, it's going to take me down to, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, right? If I keep hanging on to self-pity, it's going to take me to bitterness and resentment. And so, but this is what I found. When I, even when I realize the dangerous path I'm on, it's really hard to, pick a new thought to think in the moment when my emotions are just screaming at me. When my emotions are screaming, there's no hope, and this is never going to change, and it's never going to get any better, it's hard to go, but uh, I know I should think some sort of positive, happy thought now, and that happy thought would be... Right? That's like really hard to do. So what I learned that I had to do was I had it in my sane moments, I had to come up with good things to think in my insane moments. I I call them ready-made thoughts. It's where all I had to do is just pull them out. I didn't have to dream them up at that moment. They're all ready to go, ready to use for my insane moments. In my sane moments, I wanted to come up with a list of things to think about when I realized when my emotions were just screaming at me, like, this is horrible and it's awful and she's a jerk and I've never, and I'm such a failure and everything, whatever your, your issue is. Now, those thoughts needed to be written down ahead of time or chosen ahead of time so they're ready to go. Uh, Most of mine are right here. I would say probably any, just about any time, if you catch me and I've got my backpack, which happened to be sitting right down here this morning, if you open my backpack, you will find this. And this little notebook, it's got a whole list of what I call marching orders from God. So I don't forget what's important. But it's got a whole list of safe thoughts, ready-made thoughts. And so I can open to the appropriate page and start going through that. They're ready for me to use. If you were to log on to my music player, 
you, you would probably figure out what some of my, my issues are simply by looking at the names of my playlists. Sorry. Someday we'll probably talk more about some of this stuff. But some things happened over the last eight years, and God's good and, that, and all that, and I don't want to take away anything from what God did. But over the last eight years, fear has become a much bigger player in my life. Which is why if you go to my playlist, in my music player, you will see the very first playlist is simply titled one word, Courage. So that in the midst of the fear, all I have to do, guys, I don't have to start thinking, what should I think about now? All I have to do is pull up my phone or pull up my laptop, hit go, and turn up the volume. And you know what happens over time when I do that. As we use... My, as I use my mind, it begins to slowly but surely influence my emotions. Right? So we can use our mind. We could use our, our, our body and our will and our body is another way we can influence our emotions. Right? Remember, in this case, our will is referring to our, our ability to choose. So in other words, I, I can make a choice and then use my body to carry out that choice. So for example... Uh, I can reinforce the right values through investment. That's what Matthew 6 is all about, right? Jesus said this, don't store up treasures for yourself, treasures on earth, right? But do store up for yourself treasures in heaven. In other words, make a choice. I'm going to value this thing, and then I'm going to do something about it. I'm actually going to make an investment in something that will last forever, right? And then notice how it goes. See the impact, the influence on our emotions? What's it happen? It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here, heart is referring to my, not only my values, but also my emotions. My emotions and my values will get influenced as I use my mind and my will to make a choice, which I then carry out with my body. I'm going to use my will and my body together. You see another great example of this in Philippians chapter 4, where Paul writes this, Rejoice! In the Lord. Now, is rejoice an emotion word, or is that, is that a choice word? Joy is the emotion. Rejoice is not an emotion, is it? It's an action. It's a verb. Paul's saying, make the choice to rejoice, and then use your body to carry that choice out. You will rejoice. Right? He says, are you going to rejoice in the Lord always? I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone, and the Lord is near. So don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So here are the choices. I'm going to choose to rejoice, and I'm going to choose to tell God what it is I'm really hoping he will do. That's the present your request to God part. I will choose, and then I will carry it out using my body. For best results, do it out loud. Right? So God, I'm going to thank you for something. That's the with Thanksgiving part. And then I'm going to tell you what it is I'm going to hope you're going to do about this situation I'm in. That's the present your request part. Now notice the influence that Paul says that will have on the other parts of us as humans. What, what does it say? And the peace of God which surpasses understanding will... Guard your hearts and minds. You've got it all wrapped up in there. Your emotions, your values, all that will get influenced by the action that started with a choice of the will. And so we can uh, use our mind and or we can use our will and our body to influence our emotions. Of course, there's a third way we can influence our emotions, right? And that's we can use our social contacts. We've all figured this out already. There are certain people, right? Do I even need to finish this? There are certain people that when you're around, it has an emotional impact on you. There, there are some people that w I, I can't be around them without having my spirit lifted. I would love to get to the point someday where I'm that kind of a person. I don't think I'm there, but I would love to get there. 
There's another person in my life who I, I don't think it's them. I think it's probably me somehow, but I can't be around them without becoming discontent with the stuff that I own. Because every time I'm with them, they're, they're showing me new toys and they're talking new stuff and they're, right, it's probably just me. But I, it's like every time I'm with them, I end up not happy, discontent. And so I love this person, but I need to limit that as I, and I need to prepare. I need to say, God, help me. I'm going to go, you're right. So our social context can influence our emotions. Um, oh, there are certain activities in socially. Uh, the very, uh, because of the way I work and which days I take off and everything, the very last thing I do in my work week is Thursday. I finally get this sermon cranked out, at least as good as it's going to be. And I send, I send the PowerPoint off to the computer here, and I send it off to tomorrow who's putting the bulletin together. And, and, I, and I make the trek home, and I am wiped out by about Thursday at 5. I've, I am spent. And so almost every Thursday, the very last thing I want to do is get back in the car at 6.15 and go to small group. You're probably a much better person than I am, just being honest, because that's the kind of church we have here, where we can just be honest and say it how it really is. Every week, I am so glad at about 9.30 that I went to small group. There's just something about being around those people. We laugh. We pick on Sandy Crosley. We laugh about picking on Sandy Crosley. I realize my problems aren't the biggest ones. <laughs> we eat too much. That's probably somewhere else on that chart, right? No, but then we pray for each other. And my spirit, my emotions, somehow got magically transformed. Same thing happens often in ministry. I, I know a lot of times when people are going through really dark times and they say, what do I do, what do I do? I say, oh, I'll make sure you're involved in ministry. There's something about getting out there and being out and be beyond yourself. There's something about having to go to God and say, God, if you don't show up, I'm not going to be able to deliver the goods today. And then that ministry, that social context, as we try to love someone else in Jesus' name, God somehow fills us and changes our emotions. So can I pick the emotions I feel? No, probably not. Can I influence them? Absolutely. So let's tie this together. Jason, why don't you take it to that black screen for a second. I, I, just Let's get personal for a moment uh, and let me just ask, you know, where, where's the danger for your personality type and, and the patterns that you learned and in your family, every family has a different way of handling emotions. You're, you're taught certain rules and stuff. And there, there were things that got reinforced as you were growing up. Uh, and maybe in, in your, your life so far, you, you develop certain habits and you've got a certain personality type. So wh where's the danger side for you? Where's the normal preset kind of emotions off the track way for you? Is it to ignore your emotions totally? Is that kind of, you know, how your personality and your upbringing led you to kind of just ignore your emotions, or, or or maybe it's you don't ignore them, but but you don't ever follow through and use them for their appropriate purpose. So, so you have them, but you but you don't you don't let them motivate you to do what God intends to do with them. Or maybe it's maybe 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 it's this illustration thing that I did right up here with with Ryan. Maybe it's for you. The whole issue is you just try to focus on containing them, but don't totally ignoring the toxicity level. Of the heart, maybe that's it, or or maybe maybe the issue is, uh, is isn't that your your danger point is to go well beyond the limits of what God says. This is where you can go with your emotions, and so you've got this whole lifestyle going of worry or anxiety, or fear, or or um, or something else like that. Or or maybe it's none of those. Maybe it's just for you. It's just it, you just experience emotions and. 
you don't even try to think about them, like and what what or influence them. I don't know where it is. But here's what I what I want us to challenge us with this week, as we think about this. You know, we're we're going to get tested in some way. So how, how are you most likely to get tested this week? In this area of emotions. And in light of that, and in light of the four actions we've talked today about that God's done, what these four things that God did to, to help us not be enslaved, what what's one what one proactive step, one proactive step do you sense that God wants you to take with him this week? Guys, we live our life in response. Our life is ninety percent about what God's done for us and ten percent about what we do in response. God's done the big work of not wanting, of putting things in place to help us not be enslaved. What's that one thing that you sense? God's saying, man, I, I want to help you this week. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Because God's desire, God's dream is that for you and me to be free. Free like Jesus, right? So Jason, would you bring up that next slide? Free like Jesus. Able to feel. A- able to be moved by our emotions. Able to act for the good of God when our emotions conflict. You know, to choose. God, my emotions are conflicting, but I pick you. Able to store up treasure. In other words, God's desire is for us to be free and to be fully alive. Able to tap in and use our emotions, but not to be enslaved.